Look at this cute, adorable camera. Recently, I used the Fuji X-T5 to make a short film, and today I'm gonna share my experience making the film as well as my review of the camera with the class. So let's all strap a cup of coffee to our hands and prepare for this strange yet cinematic ride. At the end of this video, I'll mention some other Fuji cameras that are still amazing in 2023 that you might not be expecting. So stick around for that. Some of you out there might be asking, Zach, why the frick would you make a short film on the Fujifilm X-T5? It's clearly a photo first camera and there are plenty of other options that are clearly better for filmmaking like the FX30 from Sony and even Fuji's X-H2 and X-H2S. So why the X-T5? And to that I would say first, you're cute. Second, I do what I want. And third, I had a beautiful, passionate relationship with the X-T4. So when I saw the X-T5 announced, my bones started shaking underneath my skins and I, I got excited to try it out, okay? So that's the journey we're on. Making the short film was actually quite a bit of a challenge with this camera and we're gonna get into all that stuff. But as soon as my hands touched the body of this camera, I knew that I was gonna have to rig it out because it's very lightweight and I knew I was gonna go for a handheld kind of mockumentary style for some of the shots and I didn't wanna have all those micro jitters and I was also nervous to rely on IBIS to fix that so I attached the camera to my shoulder rig. I made a dedicated video about this rig if you're curious, it'll be in the description. And also I used the legendary Sigma 18-35 to thanks to my buddy Tucker. I attached the lens using the Fringer EFX to Pro 2 something adapter. It ended up working super well. So all the gear was acquired and set up and now we just had to work within a very limited time frame. Luckily, the two professional actors that I hired, AKA my friends Brady and Christian, have worked with me on dumb video projects in the past so they knew that speed was gonna be essential for this type of a project and they were ready to rock. This is where I ran into problem number one with the X-T5. As I was editing the interviews and all the scenes from this little short film, I noticed that the audio from the lobs had a little bit more noise than I'm used to. And I think it's because of me relying on the internal preamps of the X-T5. Because when you're using the Rode Wireless Go 2s, it shoots that audio signal directly into the camera so you can have those audio tracks just automatically sync to your footage. So. The preamps I noticed from the X-T5 were a little noisier than I thought, and that definitely could be a user error. I thought I set the levels to be relatively correct. Usually I try to record audio between negative 20 and negative 12 decibels and then compress it to boost it up later, but I still got a little bit more noise than I was expecting. Luckily with the Wireless Go 2s, it also records internally. So whenever possible, I was syncing up those tracks back to the footage from the X-T5, which was way more work than I was prepared for. But it ended up sounding pretty dang good. I love the zone, but they're not good. They consistently push teams alone, no helpful comms. They're just, they're just bad. I definitely don't think the internal preamps on the X-T5 are bad, but I don't think they're the best either. So if you are gonna use this camera, just be aware of that and do your tests before you shoot. Unlike me, I like to learn the hard way, if you haven't noticed. The second issue I ran into with the X-T5 while shooting this project is low light. Because we had very limited time to shoot this project, we had to shoot a couple scenes with no lighting gear just because it was gonna take too long and we were racing against the clock. So the outdoor scene we shot, I think I shot it around 2000 ISO for all those shots. And it's not bad, but it's definitely not perfect. You know, the lesson there is just, Use lighting gear. Basically, this is just documenting my rookie mistakes and uh, making me look dumb, but hopefully it will help you. Coffee at 5 p.m., another mistake. <sighs> now we gotta talk about the biggest issue with this camera. You might not wanna hear me say this, but I wish it had a flip screen. <clears throat> Three-way tilting LCD that so many of you have been asking us to bring back. You might be tired of hearing this debate or maybe you'll agree with me, I don't know, but before you rip your tilt screen off in protest, let me explain. While shooting this critically acclaimed film, there were tons of shots that I had to get of me filming by myself. And right away, you can tell where this is going. It's so hard to film yourself without a flip screen. I have one right now, it's a blessing. For a lot of the shots, I ended up using my Atomos Ninja 5, and that was really helpful, but it still was just really clunky. I didn't have a cage for the X-T5, so it was mounted kind of wonky and spin off the camera at times. And there were even shots that I was getting in the fridge because I wanted to look like Breaking Bad and be really cool. 
And I just kind of had to set the camera on an egg carton and just put the Ninja in there and hope that it wouldn't slip out and break. I think Sony and Panasonic have proven that these problems can be alleviated. Just look at the screen on the S1H. It tilts up and down if you want, and it flips. Same with the brand new Sony A7R5. It tilts and it flips. It's the best of both worlds, especially the one on the Sony. It's not that bulky, so it's not like you're really sacrificing space or anything. And because of this screen dilemma, I was forced to rely on Fuji autofocus with a third-party lens for some of these shots, and that's just getting into risky territory. Fuji's autofocus isn't terrible, but it's just not up to that Canon or Sony standard. And I think Fuji could convert so many people to their cameras if they just had that super snappy tracking like Sony and Canon. So now we're gonna really get into the review section of this video and I want you to keep these things in mind. Number one, I only had the X-T5 for two weeks. So my knowledge on the camera and my experience is limited, which is why I wanted to jump into something a little bit bigger, like a short film, instead of going outside, filming some bushes and then asking you to click my affiliate links. And two, my goal is to help you make a smart purchasing decision. So it's fun to joke around about stuff, but at the end of the day, you might be spending thousands of hard earned dollars on a camera system. So I'm gonna be honest about my opinions. Here we go. The first positive is that the X-T5 is super affordable compared to other cameras like the FX3, A7S3, C70, even the X-H2S is significantly more expensive than the X-T5. It's easy to point out flaws like the non-perfect autofocus, but when you think about the fact that you could buy two brand new X-T5s for less money than one A7S3, you're starting to sit pretty cozy. Second positive is the battery life is really good. I wasn't shooting super long takes, but I think I only recharged the battery once during this whole short film project. It was a lot of burst shooting for sure, so I don't know about the overheating with really long takes and everything, but if you have a few extra batteries in your kit, you should be all right. The third huge positive is that this camera is a true hybrid beast. Think about it, the fact that it shoots 4K up to 60 frames per second, which is honestly more than enough slow motion for me, and it does 6.2K up to 30 frames per second, you're getting that croppability for your interviews or whatever you're shooting, or if you just want high resolution, those are insane video specs. And high resolution 40 megapixel photos at the exact same time is just insane specs. Like you're getting crazy quality for less than $2,000. It's pretty sick. And the last big positive for me is the 6.2K resolution. It just depends on what you do, but I think it's a big positive because if you're shooting an interview, you can basically do two camera angles with that 6.2K. You can have the normal wide frame or crop into your 6.2K and get that nice zoom without losing any resolution if you're in a 1080 or 4K timeline. Just keep in mind that more resolution does equal more tax on your computer. I didn't have any problems editing the 6.2K footage just ungraded in my timeline and resolve. I wasn't using proxies or anything and I was getting great playback and I have the M1 Pro MacBook Pro. But once I put color grading on the footage, it started to get really chuggy. So I had to lower the timeline resolution to a quarter, which is totally fine, but just keep that in mind. Now let's talk about the negatories. Number one, the autofocus. It's mediocre, I don't know. It's just, it's not what I want it to be, Fuji. You gotta step it up. The second negative is the audio preamps could be better. Give us that analog limiter and clean ass preamps and we're good to go. Third one gets me pretty peeved off and it's the fact that the X-T5 has no headphone jack. Oh, it's a photo first camera? Well, guess what? I, I wanna listen to, to my music on the, on the camera. So give me a headphone jack in the X-T6 or I will riot and that's it. And lastly, Rolling shutter. I noticed in some of my shots that I was shooting in 6.2K, there was a little bit of weeble wobble that I wasn't super stoked about and peeved me off, but not to the level of peeve that the headphone jack did. So it's kind of a medium peeve off with the rolling shutter. Just be careful with it and you'll be fine. If this camera isn't right for you, what are some of the other Fuji Juice alternatives? I think the first and most obvious competitor to this camera is the X-H2S. I actually tested this camera a couple months ago, but I don't feel like I had enough footage or time with it to make a dedicated video about it. So I actually saved those photos and videos and decided to cram it into this video. So hopefully that's valuable to you guys. To me, the X-H2S makes the most sense for people who really want to stay within the Fuji family but 
are more on the filmmaking side. Yes, it's a true hybrid as well that can do insane video and insane photos for sure, but it definitely leans more toward the video shooter. You still get 6.2K, but you also get 4K 120 if you really need that high slow motion stuff. And you also get 26 megapixel photos that look really nice as well. So I would say if you're dead set on using a Fuji camera, but you're more of a filmmaker, but you still need some photo capabilities, go with the X-H2S. You get the option to attach a fan so you don't have to risk overheating. You have the flip screen if you want it, and you get pretty ballin' specs. But let's say you wanna stick within that Fuji family, but you don't have all these extra buckaroonies to throw around. I can say I understand that. Life ain't easy, things are expensive. Enter the X-T3. Recently, I found an X-T3 in my drawer in my house, and I was really confused at first until I remembered that I married a Fuji juicer. And then I also remembered that what's hers is mine, so. Technically, I own an X-T3 now. I've actually been shooting with the X-T3 casually for the past couple months, just taking some daily photos and stuff. And I'm still blown away by this camera in 2022. And I think you should definitely consider it for photo and video. The fact that it does DCI 4K up to 60 frames per second, and it's like 800 to $1,000 used is pretty wild. And you get really nice looking 26 megapixel photos. So this thing is absolutely still a beast. The battery life is kind of doo-doo, but if you can work around that, this is a powerful camera that won't break the bank. So don't feel pressured to drink the newest juice on the market when there are beautiful cameras like the X-T3 and the X-T4 just waiting for you to create something beautiful with them. That being said, thank you for subscribing. Text me when you get home so I know you're safe and I'll see you in the next video. Love you all so much.